Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, it is always a pleasure um, for Keith and myself, Nikki from Rock Jumper Birding Tours, to spend this time with you on a virtual adventure. Um, just to remind you, the Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen where you may send your questions and we will answer as many as we can after the webinar. The dry hummingbird capital of United States, Arizona, is our dream destination today, where jewels of the avian world can be studied in great detail. As always, Stefan Lorenz, our rock jumper birding tour leader, will go into depth about not only the birds, but feature the varied habitats and overall ecology of this fascinating area. Stefan and Claudia have been leading many tours recently, and we just love the recent feedback they both received from um, a guest saying, uh, and, and this is quoted from, from the guest, uh, Stefan and Claudia are a great team. Uh, Stefan has simply amazing hearing, spotting and helping everyone to get on the relevant birds. Um, as the only non-master birder and the oldest person on the trip, I thought they both were helpful, careful, mindful of the needs of me and each of the group. Claudia often got the bird as quickly as Stefan spotted it. The group worked for the best interest of the group. During a pandemic, the group acted responsibly and carefully. Thank you, Stefan. Welcome back. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Keith. And uh, appreciate, again, you having me um, to give another webinar. I'm looking forward to talking about Arizona today. And in particular, I want to highlight some of the specialty species there and some of the different habitats and birding opportunities. And I'll also look forward to answering some questions at the end that you may have about different seasons in Arizona or different birds you may be looking for. So in particular, uh, we actually run um, tours to Southeast Arizona. So just to give you a quick uh, overview here of where Arizona is located, it's part of the Southwestern United States. You can see here in the red circle and it's bordered by California and Nevada to the west, by Utah to the north, and it shares a border with New Mexico in the east. And then most importantly, to the south, it has a international border with Mexico. And that's where many of the specialties actually just spill across the border that we look for, to, uh, for folks to add to their United States list. So this is basically the corner, just the very southeast corner of the state that we cover. It's a relatively large state, but we actually venture out to a relatively small area. Also, Arizona has an extremely diverse, uh, it's a, uh, 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 fauna and flora, particularly birds. It has the fourth highest list, uh, bird list of any state in the US, only eclipsed by California, Texas, and Florida. So that's pretty impressive for what is essentially a completely landlocked area. So about uh, 550 birds have been recorded in Arizona. So very, very diverse. So like I said, our tours focus on the southeast corner of the state. Uh, we usually run tours during two different times of the year. One is a spring tour, which is in May, beginning of May, and that focuses on the specialty species and in particular also on the night birds. So Arizona has a high diversity of owls and night jars and uh, May, spring is an ideal time to locate those. We also run tours in the monsoon season. This would be in August. So Arizona actually experiences strong summer rainfall starting in July and August. It varies a bit from year to year. And during that trip, which is a little bit more uh, relaxed pace, but we also focus, of course, on the specialties, some of the monsoon breeders like grassland sparrows, for example. And we also witness the hummingbird migration. So in late August, the fall hummingbird migration has started. So for example, in May, we can see uh, owls really well, like migratory flammulated owl on the left there. 
And in August, we focus a bit more on hummingbirds and we have chances to see the migratory hummingbirds like the calliope hummingbird you see on the right. So just to give you an overview of uh, where we go birding, I won't go into the itinerary into too much detail, but I do cover the different habitats. So you can see the gray line in the middle here, the horizontal line, that's the border with Mexico. And the southeast corner of Arizona combines really, uh, this is where four major biomes meet. You have the Sonoran Desert coming in from the west, meeting the Chihuahuan Desert coming in from the east. So that creates a nice mix of different desert species. You have the Rocky Mountains coming in from the north. So you have a couple of Rocky Mountain species that reach their southern range limit here. And then most importantly, you have the Sierra Madre coming up from the south from Mexico. And some of these isolated mountain ranges in southeast Arizona, also known as Sky Islands, they're basically the northernmost extension of the Mexican Sierra Madre, and they harbor flora and fauna more akin to Mexico than the rest of the United States, for example. A good example is within um, just uh, north uh, east of Tucson, you have the Santa Catalina Mountains, which are home to mountain chickadees, which are a typical Rocky Mountain species. And then in the Chiricahua Mountains to the southeast from there, you have the Mexican chickadee, which is of course more widespread to the south in Mexico. So it's really a meeting point and creates a great diversity of birds. It has the highest diversity of breeding bird species anywhere in the United States, which makes for really fun birding. So just to uh, talk briefly about where we visit, we usually start our tours in Tucson and also end them there. And we visit the Santa Rita Mountains, which are one of the sky islands just south of Tucson and the famous Madeira Canyon there. We go to the Huachuca Mountains, which are a border right up against Mexico. The foothills of the southern Huachucas go right uh, up against the border. And the Huachuca Mountains are home to Miller Canyon, Carr Canyon, Ramsey Canyon, all well known among birders. And we, of course, also spend time in the Chiricahuas, one of the larger sky islands, which is home to Cave Creek Canyon. All these mountain ranges roughly top out at 9,500 feet. Uh, that's almost 3,000 meters. So they rise pretty high from the surrounding desert and uh, harbor many interesting birds and lots of unique habitats. So let me explain a little bit more um, where else we go. Besides the Sky Islands, we will be doing some birding along the riparian areas of the Santa Cruz River, the San Pedro River to the east of Sierra Vista, Patagonia and Sonoida area, which is another riparian area, and the deserts in between. So really, really diverse tour. Let me explain briefly the concept of a Sky Island. So, Basically, these mountain ranges are surrounded by arid, low-lying desert. And as you go up in elevation within these mountains, the temperatures um, decrease and moisture and precipitation also increases. So it's a little bit different on the um, north slope, which tend to be cooler and wetter versus the south slope in terms of elevation. But it roughly proceeds in the same way. So you have the low-lying desert scrub, which then turns into desert grassland which then in the foothills mostly turns into oak woodland or a chaparral uh, thickets. And then at mid elevation, you reach a mixture of pine oak woodland. I would say this holds the highest diversity of Arizona specialty, this pine oak woodland. And then as you get higher, you get into Ponderosa pine forest. And at the highest elevation, you'll actually reach fir forest, which of course is much more typical in the Rocky Mountains to the north but in some of the more protected canyons and high elevations where it's the wettest and coolest areas, you'll even reach fir forest. So you can actually travel through a sky island in one single day. And we oftentimes do so when we visit the Chiricahua Mountains, starting with birding in the desert grasslands and ending up in fir forest at the highest elevation. And as you can imagine, traversing a uh, altitudinal range like that will give you a very high diversity of species. So again, you're, we're covering from about 3,000 feet to almost 10,000 feet. So here's a short list of some of the specialties that can be found in Arizona. Um, 
in no ways is it completely inclusive or necessarily exclusive, but uh, some of the major birds we uh, people travel to Arizona for include Montezuma quail, uh, gray hawk, for example. The elegant trogon is very high on everybody's wish list usually. The very range restricted Arizona woodpecker. There are uh, quite a diversity of flycatchers in Arizona that are high on everybody's target list with very limited ranges in the United States. The unique olive warbler can be found readily in Arizona. Quite a diversity of sparrows too. And then this incredible diversity of hummingbirds. Um, more species than 13 have been recorded in Arizona, but during our August tour, we can expect to see around a dozen or 13 species if we're lucky. And then also a great diversity of owls, definitely the highest diversity of night birds anywhere in the United States, with up to nine species of owls possible and four night jars that can usually be found. And again, the night birds are more readily found during the spring tours in May, whereas hummingbirds tend to be more abundant during August. Another thing that um, most people um, do not know about Southeast Arizona is that it has a lot of wide open spaces. It's generally little visited by uh, tourists. Of course, birders come in great numbers, but there's lots of open land, lots of beautiful landscapes. And this, for example, is the road just south of Portal, Arizona, right on the border with New Mexico. And you can see beautiful desert grasslands here and very little visitation. Even birders thin out uh, generally because there are so many places to, to explore and to visit. Um, this is just north of the Santa Rita Mountains here in Box Canyon. And I should uh, say that these photos were taken this year and mostly in August and September. There's a very heavy monsoon season which rendered the desert extremely green. It's not always uh, quite like that. Um, although it does turn green in the late summer, but this was an especially lush year. And here you can see some of the uh, grasslands which are then grading into the uh, foothill oak forest and chaparral. These are the Huachuca Mountains right here. You can see literally forming an island in the distance. If you would put the scope on the highest ridges uh, that you can see in the distance there, you would see pine forest. So a beautiful change in habitat. Here's some more um, scattered oak forest. This is in Coronado National Memorial. Uh, again, beautiful landscape here, the southern end of the Huachucas. And on the right side, just to the right, just behind that ridge, actually already lies the border with Mexico, the international border. So this borders right up against Mexico. In some of the canyons, lower lying canyons, you have um, seasonal streams coming out of the mountains and that forms these beautiful oases of oak trees right in the desert. You have a, a good variety of riparian habitats. For example, this is along the Santa Cruz River, wonderful Fremont cottonwoods. And these riparian habitats, of course, harbor a good diversity of water birds and some other species that are uncommon in the dry areas of the Southwest. And here's another um, iconic uh, landscape of Southeast Arizona. This is the South Fork of the Cave Creek Canyon in the Chiricahua Mountains. You can see um, it's a bit wetter, the climate here cooler. So you have Ponderosa Pine in Arizona Sycamore, relatively low elevations. And then these cliff faces in the distance are composed of rhyolite tuff. It's really beautiful to photograph a sunset and sunrise. The Chiricahuas are volcanic in origin. And just a quick photo here of some of the higher elevations. This is again in the Chiricahuas near Rustler Park. And you can see at uh, above 8,000 feet, you get into pure uh, pine forest. Unfortunately, in recent decades, there have been a number of uh, forest fires which have decreased some of the forest cover, but fortunately all the birds that we hope to see are still present. The other aspect that's interesting about Southeast Arizona, it's one of the few places in the US that has basically essentially birding lodges. So this is one that we stay in, this is Ramsey Canyon Inn, which really caters to birders, right set in the um, Ramsey Canyon and Oak Woodland extremely diverse bird life right around the lodge. Uh, you can step out the dining room here. You see the hummingbird feeders on the right. You can see up to a dozen of humming, uh, species of hummingbirds visiting here. 
So it's really a fun place to stay. You can go out at night, look for interesting mammals and owls and uh, very comfortable. And there are a number of these types of birding lodges throughout Southeast Arizona, which makes it uh, ideal for, for birding visits. So let's talk about the different habitats and I'll start at the lowest elevation in the desert. So again, I need to preface this. This was taken during this monsoon season, which was very lush. You can see the Ocotillo in the foreground here completely greened out. And you can even see a good number of wildflowers covering the distant hillsides there. But this is what uh, August can look like in Arizona. And the rains also, of course, bring welcome cool temperatures. And it was even so wet this year that we got to see a waterfall in the desert. So this is in uh, what's called Box Canyon, north of the Santa Rita Mountains. Uh, very steep, rocky slopes here with desert vegetation. And there was an active waterfall coming down. So extremely lush and pleasant this year. So some of the common desert birds that we can see um, in around Tucson or in between the Sky Islands include white-winged doves, for example. That's a species that has increased in uh, abundance quite a bit in the United States. We can see the classic woodpecker of southeast Arizona. This is the Gila woodpecker. And you can see uh, right here in classic pose on one of the saguaro cactus. And the saguaros are typical of the Sonoran Desert. They can grow up to 18 meters or 60 feet in height and can live up to 60 to 80 years. And these Gila woodpeckers are very noisy, very conspicuous, and they will oftentimes uh, excavate a cavity in the saguaro cactus. And gamble quail is another species that's very common in the deserts here, very vocal, can often be found right in suburban areas, uh, readily visits feeders where it can be photographed easily, and they can occur in really large cubbies. Um, in some areas, it's also possible to find scaled quail, but they're much less common than the gamble quail in southeast Arizona. And of course, one of the more iconic birds of the uh, southwest of the United States, the greater roadrunner, although it does have quite an extensive range in the east too, all the way to Louisiana and Arkansas, but it's much more readily seen here in these open habitats. A pretty voracious predator of uh, large insects, and uh, lizards and occasionally even snakes. But greater roadrunners are readily seen. They'll even prefer the rocky front gardens of many of the suburban areas here where they hunt lizards. And the noisy and bold and very large cactus wren. This is the largest wren in the United States and it oftentimes builds a big globular nest inside uh, cacti or other thorny vegetation and it's also readily seen in these desert habitats and uh, quite bold, so easily photographed. And the really neat and distinctive looking black-throated sparrow, very well adapted to desert habitats, can occur, occur in some of the dr uh, driest areas anywhere and also readily photographed. They'll oftentimes sit up on top of cacti or brush to uh, sing their distinctive song. And the curve built thrasher. This is the common thrasher of Southeast Arizona. Uh, there are other thrasher species, but they're much less common. This one is the uh, oftentimes found in the open, also uh, sitting on, on people's roofs sometimes or in their gardens and also readily seen at some of the feeder setups. And the unique verdant, a very small gray bird with this uh, olive yellow head. Um, would be easily overlooked, except it has a loud and distinctive call. So that uh, makes it more easy to find and also builds a relatively large uh, rounded nest inside mesquite. And it's unique that it's the only uh, family or the only member of the Remesidae family, which is otherwise restricted to Africa and Eurasia. So it makes it a very unique species in the New World and always uh, a pleasure to see. We also have the chance uh, near Tucson to catch up with the gilded flicker. This is much more range restricted than the northern flicker, which also occurs in Arizona. But the northern flicker is oftentimes more found in mountainous areas or some of the larger riparian trees, whereas the gilded flicker really prefers desert, particularly around stands of saguaro cacti. So wherever there are lots of saguaros, 
The gilded flicker will oftentimes excavate a cavity in these large cacti uh, for nesting. So near Tucson, we have a few spots where we can find it. It's readily identified from the northern flicker, which in Arizona mainly has a red underwings, red undertail. Gilded flicker has a yellow golden underwings and a, a yellow golden undertail and a complete brownish cap that you can see here on this male, but also an Arizona specialty that we'll definitely look for. And another true Arizona specialty that occurs in the desert here is the Rufus winged sparrow. Bit of an odd name, the Rufus on the wing is very small. You can see it a little bit here, it's a small patch, but it does have a distinctive shape and song. And it prefers, um, so the edges of desert grasslands or well-vegetated washes where we can uh, find it relatively easily, especially when they're singing during the monsoon season, they'll sit up uh, for good views and photo opportunities. And another common uh, bird that belongs to the sparrow family here is the canyon towhee, which uh, occurs in drier areas, whereas its counterpart, the Abert's towhee, occurs in riparian areas. And the canyon towhee can be found pretty readily even around feeder setups. As you can see here, this is actually near Portal, near the border with New Mexico. In addition to the low-lying desert, uh, we also will visit some desert thorn scrub that occurs on steeper slopes. And um, this is a relatively unique habitat that's home to um, some rare sparrows and buntings. So right here in this image, this again is Box Canyon. You can see lots of ocotillo growing on these slopes. And this is really the preferred habitat of the beautiful varied bunting. Here you can see a male sitting up on a stalk of ocotillo, singing in a way, uh, really gorgeous colors. Uh, the females, like most buntings, are more of a plain brown color. And this is definitely one of the highlights we can find in Arizona. It's not too widespread, but can be fairly common in the right habitats. Another true specialty here is the five-striped sparrow. So if you look at the, the face pattern, so you have the supercilium and a white mustachial and a white throat stripe. So three and then two more on the other side, adds up to five stripes, um, hence the name. It's a relatively large sparrow and just has a toehold in the United States, uh, very range restricted, more widespread in Mexico, of course. But there are only two or three locations in the United States where it can be regularly found. And during the monsoon season, they'll set up territories and they'll sit up quite readily to sing and proclaim the territory. Again, this one is sitting up on an ocotillo. So this one is probably a species that's a bit more easier to find in August versus May, for example. And it's quite large and distinctive. Moving away from the desert a little bit, we get into an even lusher habitat. These are these mesquite thickets. So again, this photo was taken this August, so very lush and green. This is a Patagonia Lake State Park. And these mesquite thickets are home to several specialty species. One being the Northern Beardless Terranulate, for example. A very uh, small, uh, nondescript flycatcher uh, fortunately, it also has a relatively loud and distinctive call, uh, which uh, makes it a bit easier to locate. And it's the only terranulate that regularly occurs north of the border in the U.S. and can be fairly common and widespread in the uh, mesquite thickets here. Just got to look in the right places. And another species that we can find in this habitat is the unique phenopepla. Here's a male with a beautiful blue glossy or black glossy plumage. They have these big white wing patches that they show in flight. And um, this one really, this species prefers mistletoe. So it's oftentimes found around fruiting mistletoe. And it's part of the silky flycatcher family, which is essentially endemic to North America. A couple more members of that family occur in Mexico all the way down to Panama but the phenopepla is a very unique species and can be very common uh, if there are fruiting trees around or fruiting mistletoes. Of course, we'll start seeing some hummingbirds in the desert too. In the winter, Costa's hummingbird is quite common, but during May and August, it's actually a fairly uncommon and tricky species to find. 
But the one that's always around is the Anna's hummingbird. And here you can see a male perched up. Um, this is a relatively widespread species, occurs all the way into the foothills. And this male is really showing off its magenta colored head. Uh, very easy to identify just by the uh, color of the gorget and the um, top of the head right there. A medium sized uh, hummingbird. And one of the more specialties of the desert is the lucifer hummingbird. Uh, this has a really um, restricted range in the U.S., only found in southeast Arizona and some places in West Texas. It prefers um, desert with agave plants. And fortunately, in southeast Arizona, there's a location in the Huachuca Mountains in Ash Canyon, where usually a male or up to two males and females will visit a feeder setup. So there's a reliable place to see this wonderful species. Again, it's very distinctive, very uh, long decurved bill for its size, beautiful colored gorget, and a skinny forked tail. So that's uh, one of the targets that we look for at Ash Canyon. And that setup is really wonderful. You go find a shady spot to sit at and wait for the hummingbirds to show up. And there's several of these hummingbird setups um, these feeder setups throughout Southeast Arizona, which makes for really relaxed birding and excellent photography. The desert also holds some gnat catchers. This is the resident and relatively widespread, but not super common black-tailed gnat catcher. You can see if you look carefully, its undertail is mostly black and it's got quite a bit of brownish tones on the wing and on the back. And right alongside it, you can find the much more rare and range restricted black capped gnat catcher. This is another species um, more readily found and widespread in Mexico, but it has a small range here in Southeast Arizona, a handful location where it occurs, not always easy to find and uh, not always easy to identify either, but it does have a, a longer bill. And also its undertail is nearly completely white with a relatively strongly graduated tail. Uh, fortunately, it has a very distinctive call, so that's often the first clue uh, to its whereabouts when we go looking for it. But it's one of the um, now, I would say, resident specialties in Southeast Arizona. And the crystal thrasher. So this thrasher is much more secretive and much less common than the aforementioned curve belt thrasher. Really prefers thickets feeding on the ground and you need quite a bit of luck for one to pop out into the open and sit up. Uh, they're more vocal and readily seen in uh, late winter, early spring actually in February, March. So during the summertime, it can be quite a tricky species to track down. But once you see it, quite distinctive, fairly dark thrasher with this huge strongly curved bill and rufous undertail. Quite a beautiful species, but it does take some effort and luck to see it well and the desert cardinal, also known as the Pyroloxia. This is essentially a washed out cardinal that occurs in the desert. Uh, there are some locations where northern cardinals and Pyroloxias actually come to the same feeder um, together, giving great comparisons. But the Pyroloxia has a much more bulbous bill, as you can see, and uh, generally a more grayish or washed out plumage, different shaped crest, but uh, always a highlight to see this species in the desert. At night, uh, here we can find western screech owls. Uh, they prefer uh, areas along uh, streams uh, in the desert where there's a little bit more woodland and they're quite common here in southeast Arizona. Oftentimes we can actually track one down on a day roost or peaking from a nesting cavity within these uh, large cottonwood trees along the San Pedro River. But here a gray morph was showing very well during the uh, nighttime. And also the elf owl. This is another bird that uh, lots of people have near the top of their target list in southeast Arizona. One of the smallest owls in the world. It feeds mainly on large insects like moths. Um, and oftentimes we know of a active nesting cavity during the spring. So this is another bird that's much more readily seen in May and we can uh, set up near the cavity at dusk and wait for them to emerge. They oftentimes just pop their head out a little bit right before sunset, and then we'll wait, wait till they get active and get good photo opportunities and good views. 
and it's really not much larger than a robin. I mean, it's it's just a tiny owl, very distinctive with those yellow eyes and white eyebrows. And this, for example, right here was uh, nesting in one of the canyons in the Huachuca Mountains. And we can also see some night jars in the desert, uh, most commonly the common poor will, which can be tracked down by its namesake call. It prefers rocky slopes within the desert and we can get good views. The other night jars um, that we look for, uh, lesser night hawks will be feeding oftentimes near riparian areas and the Mexican whippoorwill occurs in the mountains in the oak woodland or pine oak woodland. So we oftentimes venture up into the mountains at night. In the very range restricted buff collared nightjar, we'll make a special trip to near the border with Mexico to look for it in the scrub desert. But we tend to have very good luck finding all four and getting good views of all four species of nightjars during our May tours. So let's move on to the grasslands. So we'll move up a little bit in elevation and reach the desert grasslands. Here, this photo was taken near the town of Portal again, uh, looking back west. And here's an image showing the Las Cienegas grasslands. You can see again, it was a very uh, lush monsoon season. The grasslands are completely green. You can see some of the rain falling in the background there. And then the mountain range you see in the background is one of the classic sky islands. Those are the Santa Rita Mountains. So we are just east of the Santa Rita Mountains here and just a wonderful uh, landscape. And again, these rains in August really cool down the temperatures, making it very pleasant. Some of the common birds we see in these grasslands include Inkaduff. Um, that's a species that's actually declined quite a bit throughout the United States. And we also see Eastern Meadowlarks. Uh, so you might be surprised to find Eastern Meadowlarks in the Southwestern United States. But in these pristine grasslands, um, pretty much everything you see during the summer are eastern meadowlarks, not western. And they're represented here by an isolated subspecies, sometimes known as Lillian's or Chihuahuan meadowlark. And um, recent genetic and vocal evidence really points to this being a distinctive species. So it's a good one to see because um, it is completely allopatric to the rest of the eastern meadowlarks and the eastern United States and might be elevated to full species in the future. Fortunately, they're quite common, easy to see in some of the pristine grasslands that we visit. And another specialty here is the Ben Dyer Thrasher. Never very common, but these grasslands, these desert grasslands are the best place to look for them. Uh, superficially similar to the widespread curve billed Thrasher, but does have a shorter bill. And also the spots on its underparts are arrow shaped versus more oval in shape. And with a good look, it's uh, readily identified from a curve belt thrasher. But we do have to make some effort to look for this species as it oftentimes spends uh, most of its time on the ground and uh, we have to get lucky for one to sit up well, but definitely a big target during our time in Southeast Arizona. And this is also a great place for grassland sparrows. And these will be in full song during the monsoon season including the bottom eye sparrow. And oftentimes it sings right alongside the very similar Cassin sparrow. So both of these species are superficially similar. Luckily, they have very distinctive songs. The bottom eye gives kind of a rollicking song, whereas the um, Cassin sparrows has a more protracted sort of sweet whistle that is very distinctive once you learn the differences. And in the Las Cienegas grasslands, for example, they all sing um, very close to each other, uh, offering fantastic comparisons and also some photo opportunities. So from the grasslands, we move to slightly higher elevations or to more riparian zones. And we can visit places like this, the Harshar Canyon in the Patagonia Mountains, uh, quite lush and it offers a completely new set of bird species. Or we can visit the Sonoida Creek Here's a uh, picture of our group. Actually, you can see the creek itself is fairly dry despite the heavy monsoon season. But uh, our group is watching a small water hole in the distance here, which proved irresistible to a lot of birds during the heat of the day. It was just a really fantastic place for observation. There were scores of lazuli buntings, blue grosbeaks coming to drink, 
McGillivray's warblers, common yellow throats, even Lucy's warblers came to drink, a variety of doves. So that can be a real magnet for birds, any of these water holes uh, during August, particularly during the heat of the day. And of course, good photo opportunities too. So here's the aforementioned uh, lazuli bunting, uh, just a stunning species. Uh, again, the females are a bit more plain brown, but the males quite distinctive with these blue heads and rufous chests, and that can be a very common bird in these riparian zones in Arizona. One of the specialties we look for is the thick-billed kingbird, another species with just a toehold in the United States, uh, just a handful of locations where it can readily be found. Really distinctive once seen well, very large kingbird with a obviously large bill. Oftentimes will sit up right at the top of some uh, bare branches or dead trees. And that's one bird we look for in the Patagonia Sonoida area. And there are many other flycatchers here too, like the more widespread but stunning vermilion flycatchers, readily found in some of the grasslands or the edges of these riparian habitats. And the unique Lucy's warbler, probably one of the drabest warblers in North America, uh, among a family that's known for a high diversity of color. Um, the Lucy's warbler, you can't see it in this photo, it does have a rufous rump and a little bit of rufous on top of the head, but otherwise it is all uh, plain gray. It's quite unique though, it's one of only two species of uh, warblers nesting in cavities in North America. They'll even nest in nest boxes also, or old woodpecker holes. The other one being the prothonotary warbler of the East. But uh, these mesquite woodlands and riparian areas can be um, full of Lucy's warblers. It's a great place to see them. And if we're lucky on some of the rocky slopes, we might see the unique rock wren. Um, although by no means it's common in Southeast Arizona, but there are a few places we can look for it. And the even more impressive, uh, at least by song, I think, Canyon Wren. This is another species uh, that's not terribly common in Southeast Arizona, actually can be tricky to see because most of the time they're high up on very steep and distant cliff faces, but they are present and we can definitely make an effort to look for it. And these riparian zones are also great for migrants. So during May and during August, we're there during the uh, migration, spring and fall, of course. And many of the Western warblers and flycatchers pass through. For example, Townsend's warbler can be quite common uh, during that time of year, and we should be able to get uh, good looks of those. This one right here was in some riparian thickets near the San Pedro River. And these riparian areas are also the best place to look for the Abert's towhee. This is probably one of the most range restricted species we'll see on the tour. Its um, center of distribution really falls on Arizona, although it does occur in surrounding states and into Mexico, but it's very easy to see in Southeast Arizona where in some places they'll even come to feeders. And uh, it's got a distinctive sort of dark face mask and uh, bill color that sets it apart from the more widespread canyon towhee. So it's another target for most people coming to Arizona. And these riparian zones are also the best place to look for the violet crowned hummingbird, a fairly range restricted species in the United States. The Patton Center for hummingbird near, uh, Hummingbirds near Sonoida Creek is the best place to look for them. Although when we do our August tours, they'll start moving around, dispersing a bit, and they'll even come up to the foothills and into the canyons and can oftentimes be seen right outside the kitchen window of Ramsey Canyon Inn. So while you're having a delicious breakfast, this rare hummingbird will pay a visit. And it's uh, one of the most distinctive hummingbirds in the US with these clean snowy white underparts and a hint of violet crown right here and reddish bill. These riparian zones will also have to keep an eye to the sky. Uh, oftentimes zone-tailed hawks will pass over. Um, you can also see these up in the mountains. And in the Sonoida area, there are several pairs of gray hawks that nest there. So it's another excellent raptor species to look for. And in a few places in Southeast Arizona, you have the chance to see the Harris's hawk. This is a cooperatively hunting hawk. They live in family groups, quite unique among raptors. And um, in the Nogales area, we can oftentimes find some Harris's hawks. 
And uh, in recent years, the rare rose-throated Picard has uh, recolonized Arizona, uh, meaning there are a few pairs present during the summer. Um, this year, there was a nesting pair that successfully raised some young in the, uh, along the Sonoida Creek in the Patagonia area. And uh, so here's a beautiful male, you can see with this gray plumage and rosy throat. Uh, they've also been present along the Santa Cruz River. So it varies a bit from year to year. Some years they seem to disappear completely and then they'll return to nest. Hopefully with the uh, great monsoon season we had this year, they will be back next year, but it's always a spectacular rarity to add to the trip list. And it might surprise you that there are quite a few water birds in the desert, but there are a number of wastewater treatment plants or reclaimed wetlands that attract a wide variety of waterfowl. Uh, for example, we'll look for Mexican duck. Um, also a good variety of migrating shorebirds, which uh, shorebirds will be on the move by May and August. And also a good number of rails. Uh, for example, soras can be quite common uh, during August in some of these locations. But these wetland areas that are kind of scattered throughout Southeast Arizona will add greatly to our overall bird list and really um, provide some fun and relatively easy birding. And there are even a few spots along the Santa Cruz and San Pedro River where there's a chance to see the green kingfisher, which again has a very localized range within the United States. Not very common in Southeast Arizona, but it is a possibility to see. And some of these large cottonwoods along these rivers provide great roosting places for great horned owls. This one we found roosting on a recent August tour and just adds to the oval owl diversity. Uh, this is a very widespread species, obviously, and also so in Southeast Arizona. Sometimes we even see them right in suburban areas. So from these riparian areas, let's move a little bit higher up in elevation into the oak woodlands and chaparral habitats. Again, these are the foothills here, the Huachuca Mountains. You can see some of the scattered trees appearing as we go up in elevation. And also we will spend lots of time in these canyons, which are roughly at similar elevation, but because they're a bit more protected, uh, there's more water and cooler temperatures. They create this beautiful pine oak woodland and you can see on the left there, there's a whitish uh, trunk coming in that's an Arizona sycamore. And these sycamores are really preferred nesting sites for trogons, owls, because they do have a lot of natural tree cavities in them. And there are also uh, fir trees in this canyon and Arizona madrone, really lush um, sort of uh, subtropical locations which uh, I would say hold the greatest diversity of Arizona specialties, this particular habitat. A bird that's very abundant here and very noisy and easy to see is the acorn woodpecker. Uh, this woodpecker lives in uh, cooperatively breeding family groups and they're of course famous for collecting and stashing oaks in these big uh, granaries, oftentimes using telephone poles. Equally abundant and noisy is the beautiful Mexican jay, which mostly also feeds on oaks but it uh, will readily take handouts too if anybody is picnicking. And uh, just a gorgeous uh, jay that's common throughout uh, these canyons and readily seen uh, nearly every day of the tour. And the more specialized and more uncommon Arizona woodpecker, which also prefers these oak woodlands, uh, very range restricted, but in the right habitat, not too difficult to find. Very distinctive, uh, colored woodpecker and unmistakable. The only other similar species that occurs is the hairy woodpecker. And we will also keep our ears open for the bridal titmouse. This is oftentimes the core member of a feeding flock. So this is, we definitely want to follow them if we hear them. It's a very small titmouse, really intricate face pattern, very bold and, and tame in some places, will readily come to feeders in some locations and always a good hint that there might be a feeding flock around. And in these feeding flocks, in these canyons, we can hope to see the painted red start. This one looks a little scruffy. This was taken in August, you know, towards the trailing end of the breeding season. So it probably already had some nesting attempts or starting to molt. And, uh, the painted red start is uh, fairly common in these canyons, a very active, uh, beautiful warbler. 
And Arizona in general is a fantastic place for Western warblers, not just the specialties, but um, black-throated gray warblers are breed in good numbers. Uh, hermit warblers migrate uh, at the higher elevations usually. And we can uh, find them during May and August. We can also find the gullet race warbler a little bit easier in August during the fall migration. Yellow warblers in the bottom right hand corner there, they nest in riparian zones. Uh, we can also find Virginia's warblers, which nest in low numbers, and Grace's warblers. So it's a great place to essentially clean up with all Western warbler species and also flycatchers. For example, Cordilleran flycatchers will nest in some of these canyons alongside Dusky and Hammonds. It's a great place to come to grips with a good variety of, of Empidonex flycatchers, which always makes for fun and challenging uh, identification. And the unique sulfur-bellied flycatcher. Um, this is a, oftentimes spends a lot of time in the canopy, and, but it's easily found. It has a very distinctive, almost toy-like call and they're really fond of sycamores. In fact, uh, this August we had a pair setting up a nesting right in front of the Ramsey Canyon Inn, so we were able to uh, watch them every single day. Very um, unique and distinctive tropical flycatcher. And the dusky cap flycatcher. This is one of uh, three myarchus species that can be readily found in southeast Arizona. Dusky cap is uh, smallest, has a distinctive call, uh, almost no rufus in the tail, and this can be found in these riparian canyons and uh, oak woodland where it's most common. The other two myarchus species are the ash-roaded flycatcher in the desert and the brown-crested flycatcher in riparian habitats. And the spotted towhee is widespread too in these canyons. You can oftentimes hear their distinctive double scratch as you're walking along the trails or they're mewing at you in alarm as you're passing by. Another excellent species we'll look for here, and this can be found in oak woodland or in uh, pine forest, is the northern pygmy owl. Southeast Arizona is probably one of the easier places to see this relatively widespread but low density species. It's represented here by the mountain subspecies, which has a double call, whereas the northern subspecies, for example, in um, the northwest of the US, as more of a single call, but it's fairly readily found. It's active during the day. So we always uh, keep our ears open for its call. Uh, sometimes its presence is given away by mobbing calls of warblers and other species or uh, titmice, for example. And that's always a highlight to see and uh, high in everybody's list of wanted owls. And at night, we can set out into these uh, pine forests or oak woodland to look for the flammulated owl. Very unique, also small owl with these distinctive black eyes. As uh, its call is not always uh, easy to track down. It's got a very simple hoot. Um, but with luck, we can uh, stay out at night and try to find one. And again, this is a species that's most likely, or I should say only likely during the May tours, as it is uh, completely migratory and leaves Arizona during the fall and winter months. And here's one of the trickiest specialties in Arizona, the Montezuma quail. Never easy to find. Uh, it is not necessarily rare uh, or necessarily occurs in low numbers, but it's very secretive. Uh, rarely flushes, you almost have to step on it uh, before it will move. And if you're not hearing one or spotting one actively foraging, can be really tricky to find. Um, we have had good luck on recent tours. Sometimes, unfortunately, we only hear it calling, but here we had a wonderful male walking around the uh, grassland or the oak woodland in Madera Canyon. They really occur mainly from the grasslands into the oak woodlands, and this is a, a main target for most people. We usually spend quite a bit of time looking for them, and. Um, definitely uh, one of the, I would say, the trickiest specialty on the tour to find. And back to hummingbirds. Okay, These are very numerous in August, the Rivoli's hummingbird. Um, this was taken right outside the Ramsey Canyon Inn right here, where many males were visiting. 
This used to be known as Magnificent Hummingbird. Uh, some of you probably still know it as Magnificent Hummingbird, but it was split fairly recently into the Rivoli's Hummingbird, which occurs from the US um, through Mexico and a bit further south. And then the other uh, split that came out of that was the Talamanca Hummingbird, which is endemic to cloud forest in Costa Rica and Panama. But as many uh, participants on the recent tour said, it is still magnificent, no matter what the name is. Very large hummingbird with this beautiful uh, green gorget and uh, purple blue forecrown. And uh, the broad-billed hummingbird, this is one of the most numerous and widespread hummingbirds on the tour, occurs from the desert right up into the foothills. And again, it can be very abundant at a variety of feeder setups, like this one here in Miller Canyon. Beautiful male, you can just see a hint of its blue throat there and a distinctive red bill. And the very widespread but uh, equally gorgeous broad-tailed hummingbird. Uh, the males make a insect-like trill with their wings when they're flying, so that really clues one in very easily to their presence. Uh, also can be abundant, uh, particularly at the feeder setup in Miller Canyon, offering many repeated views and great photo opportunities. And much more localized and rare is the white-eared hummingbird. This is essentially a Mexican species that just comes across the border, somewhat similar to a broad-billed hummingbird, but you can see this distinctive dark head and big white ear stripe. And uh, this male right here was present at Miller Canyon, which is usually uh, the most reliable place to see this bird, uh, particularly in August. Um, they seem to be a bit more reliable during that uh, month and a great addition. Used to be uh, much more rare, but in recent years has become fairly regular in Southeast Arizona. And uh, this is probably the top bird on everybody's list when they come to, to this region in the US to bird is the elegant trogon. Uh, the elegant trogon is the only member of this tropical family that regularly nests in the United States. Uh, their numbers can vary. This year, for example, was Strangely, a very low year, uh, although we did manage to find it on every tour we did. And this particular uh, male right here was um, bringing in a large stick insect to an active nest. So during one of the tours, we got to watch a nest cavity with three chicks in it, and the male and female were actively bringing prey. And interestingly, everything we could see and photograph, they were all stick insects. So there are apparently lots of stick insects out there in these oak woodlands and these trogons have a knack for finding them. But just a stunning bird and definitely always a highlight in Arizona to see this species. And um, just as an aside, the, the trogons are the only bird family on the planet with a heterodactyl foot arrangement. So they have a very unique foot arrangement um, because they are, seem to belong to a relatively ancient lineage of bird species. And at night here, we can set out and look for the whiskered screech owl. This is a bit smaller than a Western screech owl with a pale bill. It's got a unique uh, call that sometimes has been described as a Morse code call. And also they only occur in gray morphs. So there are no rufous morphs like you would see in an Eastern screech owl, for example. And if we go to the right spots in this oak forest, it can be fairly common and with a bit of patience, we can oftentimes get excellent views and photo opportunities of this uh, gorgeous little whiskered screech owl. And in some of the canyons, spotted owls are present. So this is the Mexican subspecies of spotted owl. And uh, they're not always easy to find. This one was fairly obscured, but they can be found with some luck on a day roost. So after these canyons, we move up to higher elevations. This is Barfoot Canyon. Uh, oh, sorry, Barfoot Park in the Chiricahua Mountains. You can see it's pure pine forest. Here's another view in the Chiricahua showing some more of the pine forest. And this is really the last habitat we will reach. And at these high elevations, the yellow-eyed junco is a specialty that's quite common and readily seen. Also band-tailed pigeons. This is a very widespread species all the way from Alaska to South America. The subspecies, the northern subspecies, has a black tip to the yellow bill. And the specialty here is a buff-breasted flycatcher, another impidinex flycatcher, very colorful and distinctive on impidinex. 
and uh, it prefers these open pine forests. Not numerous, but there are a few locations where we can track it down. And the greater peewee, oftentimes found by its distinctive call, you can see it's a fairly large flycatcher with a massive bill and spiky crest setting it apart from other peewees. And the beautiful red-faced warbler. This can be found in the canyons and in the higher pine forest. Very distinctive looking warbler with this uh, black mask and red face. And the unique olive warbler. This is a female plumaged bird here. This is actually not a true warbler. It's found in its uh, own family now, uh, very distant, distantly related to our um, New World wood warblers. And um, this uh, oftentimes is found exclusively in the canopy. So it can be a bit tricky to uh, track down, but the Chiricahuas are a great place to find it. And most uh, special here uh, is the Mexican chickadee. This has a tiny range in the US, only found in the Chiricahua Mountains and the Animas Mountains of New Mexico. And even here, it's not very common. It's an uncommon species, very tricky to find in May and probably a bit easier to find in August um, after they've done, um, after they finish nesting, they're moving around a little bit more. Fairly large chickadee with a big black bib, but uh, another one of these uh, uncommon specialties that we'll track down. And just as a reminder here, I put this map in here again to remind you guys how close we are to Mexico. And as you can imagine, every once in a while, uh, birds from south of the border spill into Arizona as vagrants or rare visitors. Some of these include Rufus Cap Warbler, which in recent years has nested in Arizona repeatedly in some of the lower uh, desert canyons. So if any of these are around, we'll try to track them down. Or the Barreline Hummingbird. This year we had a Barreline Hummingbird right outside the Ramsey Canyon Inn. Another rare visitor, but we were able to enjoy it nearly every day we were there, um, visiting the feeders uh, roughly the same time every day. Or the Ruddy Ground Dove. I took this photo here in Arizona about 15 years ago. So not a great photo, but that's a species that has become more common, uh, more, co more common vagrant to the state, uh, more so in winter, but uh, sometimes they'll stick around into the summer months too. And the flame collar tanager. Um, there was one individual that came for several years to the same location in uh, Madera Canyon, and now they're more sporadic visitors. But again, uh, they, if any of these rarities are around, we'll oftentimes spend time to try to find them. Even Northern Chicanas will visit some of the wetland sites. Uh, this individual stuck around the Santa Cruz River for several months, even into May, where our group uh, spring tour was able to see it. And if we're extremely lucky, an ear quetzal will make a visit. Um, they really show up in Arizona only every few years. Um, last year, there was one, uh, or more than one actually, that stuck around for several months. And if they show up, they're more likely to show up in late summer and into the fall. But if one of these spectacular birds is reported, we would of course make an effort to look for it. In mammals, uh, Southeast Arizona is a great place for mammals. Uh, cliff chipmunks are common in the canyons, for example. We have a chance to see white-nosed coati, which they seem to be more now than in the past, um, more of a sort of tropical raccoon relative. Um, with a much bigger range south of the border. And night outings can also be productive, not just for owls, but also for mammals. Uh, we've seen ringtail, for example, a number of skunk species are present, four species, like this American hognose skunk, quite a beautiful, unique animal. And colored peccaries are present in good numbers alongside uh, white-tailed deer. Those are some of the larger mammals we can hope to see. And even black bear is present in good numbers. American black bear, uh, which uh, prefers the canyons and the mountains. And uh, there are still good numbers of mountain lions that uh, roam the mountains of Southeast Arizona. But of course, they are, need a lot of luck uh, to see those elusive animals. So without further ado, I don't want to go into the uh, reptiles, although there are many. But um, I want to thank you guys for taking the time. To, to listen, learn a little bit about Arizona, and I hope you have some questions. And uh, thank you again from, from me and uh, Rock Jumper and Nikki and Keith for taking the time. Uh, thank you so much, Stefan.
Um, before we delve into Q&A, um, just would love to invite all of you uh, to Wednesday, October the 27th, um, to go to Costa Rica with us. This is a wonderful Central American country, and it's uh, one of the world's most famous and respected destinations for AV tourism. Over 920 species of birds have been recorded in Costa Rica, and this figure is made even more impressive by its size, being 13 times smaller than the state of Texas. Fantastic infrastructure abounds and the food is fabulous, while the birding opportunities and ability to interact with the local ticos are both plentiful and meaningful. Um, even for such a small country, Costa Rica is home to seven endemic birds and over 70 species that are considered the endemic. Um, and I have put the link in your chat if you'd like to sign up to that. Thanks. Over to you, Keith. <laughs> ah, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nikki. Um, yeah, thank you, Stefan. That was uh, incredible. I remember I have fun, fun memories of, of Texas back in like 2008, but it's been a long time since I was last in the US. And oh, all those Arizona birds, man, Sky Islands and oh, all, that, all the desert plains. That just, that just looks amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, so, so let's get in. I think you covered it so extremely well, Stefan, that there, there's not a lot of questions, but there are, there are some interesting ones that have come through. So we'll, we'll get stuck in there. Um, just um, let's have a look here. So, so Steve's just asking here, are any other areas of Arizona worth birding um, or is it quite specific sort of the locations? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, yeah, they're... They're all, I mean, there are many other interesting landscapes and locations in Arizona. I mean, it is the Grand Canyon State. Um, you know, that in itself would be worth visiting for the landscape. And there are, um, Cal there's a population of California condors there. But the other areas besides that, you know, if you move sort of north um, from southeast Arizona, where I've been talking about, you'll start getting into some true Rocky Mountain species. Um, I mean, there are even locations you'll see three-toed woodpeckers and dusky grouse, but most of those species are found, you know, outside of the state more readily or more readily even on other tours that we offer. So the specialties are really restricted to that area that I covered. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't many uh, other areas worth birding. Um, one exception to that I would say is uh, there's a canyon um, a bit further north of what we covered that has a nesting population of uh, common blackhawks. So that would be one site that I can think of that would definitely be worth visiting in addition to, to what we cover. But otherwise, uh, I would say 99% of the specialties are found within that relatively small area in the southeast corner. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great, great info, Stefan. Thank you. I think that, uh, that settles it quite nicely. I think, as you say, you know, you can get some of these birds that just sort of sneak in and get into parts of Arizona, yeah. but they're more readily found elsewhere. And it just yes. makes sense to focus on the Arizona specials where, where they are. Um, excellent. Quite a, quite a few folks are asking about the temperatures. Um, and isn't it hot in August and sort of, you know, what's, what's the difference between um the, the spring and the fall you know when we when our trips are time for okay yeah in in general i mean i must describe in the desert the temperatures are warm to hot it really depends a bit on the day on on the activity of the monsoon rains in august but it can be it can be hot in the low-lying deserts and we usually avoid those areas um during the uh, heat of the day or for example, we'll bird them very briefly. Um, you know, we'll go to a location if it's really warm, we know we have a specific bird in mind and we'll, we'll try to, to find it quickly and then move on. Uh, but in general, I would say that the climate is mild and really pleasant uh, in the mountains. It's very comfortable because as you go up in elevation, obviously the temperature decreases. Um, we even had a very cold day almost. I mean, by cold, I mean, you had to put on a sweater or a jacket up at the highest elevation. So it does vary. And um, May is very pleasant, uh, not too hot. And in August, you really have the help of the monsoon 
rains that cool down the temperatures and make it more pleasant. And if, there, if it's a really hot day, we just tend to avoid the low, uh, low lying areas and head up into the mountains where it's uh, really comfortable. For example, at Ramsey Canyon Inn, you will wake up in the morning to about 70 degrees or, or about 20 degrees Celsius. So just perfect temperatures for birding. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, I think that gives a, gives a very good rundown of what it's, what it's like, what to expect. And it, can be, it can be a bit rainy. I'm sorry, Keith, it can be a bit rainy in August if you have a really strong monsoon season and then we'll, we'll wait out those periods. But sorry, mm -hmm. uh, what were you saying, Keith? Nice. I was just saying, I think, I, I guess, being based in, in one zone and using somewhere like uh, Ramsey Canyon Inn gives you a, a nice bit of flexibility where you can sort of hit some mountains or lowlands, depending on what the weather's looking like in the, in the coming days. So that, that flexibility is nice as well. Exactly. Uh, there are lots of areas, and we, we always have quite a bit of flexibilities on these tours. There are lots of areas to cover, lots of areas to explore. I mean, there are dozens of these canyons that, you know, some of them are not heavily visited at all by birders. So depending on how we're doing, what we're finding, sometimes we'll go to you know, check out a new spot if we've seen most of the targets in one location or go back to a location and then also work around any thunderstorms that might roll in. It's a really, just a really pleasant tour. Um, the landscape is stunning throughout. And like I tried to explain in my talk a little bit, very little visited, lots of open space, lots of open, beautiful country, mm -hmm. uh, extensive national forest that we spend time in. So it's just, um, just gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, those, those scenery shots that you were showing, I mean, that was, you know, that was worth attending just, just for itself, just to take you to those big, wide, wild, open spaces. It, it looks absolutely gorgeous. Um, reminds me of parts of South Africa, actually, doesn't it, Nikki? Yeah, um, the La Cienegas grassland, when you're driving through, you have these big plains of grassland and these, you know, mesquite, sort of almost acacia type trees in the distance. Um, the, the large ungulates are missing, you know, you don't have, <laughs> you don't have, you got a uh, pronghorn, which I actually didn't put in the presentation. Uh, pronghorn are fairly common out there, but that's okay. the only large ungulate you're, go you're going to see. <laughs> And coyotes, maybe. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, Patricia's asking, she's, saying she's visiting her daughter in Tucson in December. Um, are there any places nearby at that time of the year that you'd suggest are the best place where she could, she could see birds? Yeah, um, December is not, not an ideal time uh, mm. because um, a lot of these specialty species are migratory. Uh, and they'll leave a lot of the hummingbirds, flycatchers, warblers. Um, a few stay, but not many. I would recommend um, Saguaro National Park, which is sort of in two units on either side of Tucson would be a fun place to visit. And even going down to Sierra Vista and going up into Ramsey Canyon can be nice, but it will be a, a lot quieter than it is uh, during the summer months because many of these specialties uh, aren't present um, you can go down to it's a place called San Pedro House on the San Pedro River, which has real active feeders. Uh, but most of the birds present will be uh, like short distance migrants from, from the mm. U.S., you know, variety of sparrows and so on. Yeah. Um, but even Tucson itself, I mean, uh, there's um, you know, this <laughs> the little town itself mm -hmm. will have some good desert species uh, present yeah. too. But I would start with Saguaro National Park. Excellent. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you. Um, yeah, there you go, Patricia. Um, some good little little bit of insight there. I'm sure you'll get a few good species in December when you go and visit your daughter. Um, but yeah, probably probably I'll have to plan a, a trip back in the spring or fall to come and get some yes, of the, yeah, yeah, the, the other real specials of, of Arizona. Um, great. Thanks, Stefan. Um, yeah, then some other some other ones here. Um, Stuart's just asking about owls and how they react to flash photography. Um, maybe you can give some insights into that one. So, um, the, I guess the, the, the opinions are probably divided on it, but um, I use a uh, spotlight, which I will, uh, you know, I will use a relatively strong spotlight for brief periods while everybody's taking a photo and then just putting the owl on the edge of the light. But uh, a lot of folks uh, do like the photographer photograph owls with a, a flash because it does give better better image quality, better results. 
So on that, they will be fine. Most of the owls that we find, um, you know, we enjoy watching them for a few moments and then we'll, we'll leave them in peace. But most of the time they don't fly off. They will just sit, kind yeah. of call, investigate. And um, the best thing to do with flash, of course, is have the flash kind of offset from the camera, either using an arm or using a remote triggered flash and have somebody else hold it. And then that way you avoid getting the, the red coloration in the eye. And it, it works generally well. And um, most of the owls we see, uh, folks that would like to get photos of them usually do get good, good photos. Excellent. Thanks for that insight, Stefan. Um, Betty's just asking, is, uh, is Fort Huachuca open to birders nowadays? It is open to birders. Um, there's a few more restrictions, obviously, um, but I actually don't visit uh, Fort Huachuca on, on the tours. And uh, the reason being that they're, that, you know, the time it gets to go in there basically does not, it's not worth the effort. There's nothing there that can't be found more readily elsewhere. Uh, it used to be very famous for a pair of spotted owls that would uh, roost in a place called Shelight Canyon, but those owls have not been seen there regularly for more than a decade now. Um, the spotted owls have become a little bit tricky to find in, in Arizona because there isn't an easily accessible pair anymore. I usually go to a different location now to look for them. So the short answer is yes, it is open uh, to visiting birders, but I usually don't, don't go through the effort to go there. Good stuff. Um, Gordon's got a, got a few questions here for you. I'll, I'll ask them all at once. So you can kind of deal with them as a, as a whole. Sure. Um, he's just asking, so, so how many times have you been to Arizona? Uh, do you live there seasonally? Uh, and then just commenting about all your photographs, just saying um, they're, they're extremely high quality for, for many species. Um, and did you take them all? And, and were these over a, a bunch of tours that you've taken them? Or uh, I guess getting some insight into that. Okay. Um, so the easiest one is uh, I don't live in Arizona, but I do spend a lot of time there. I would say starting the first trip would have been 16 years ago and then uh, regularly going back um, uh, quite a bit too also do uh, back in the day when i used to chase rare birds i would occasionally go go to that corner of the state to chase some rare birds i don't do that as much anymore now and um so yeah uh, more than more than 15 years i've been going to to arizona regularly um mm -hmm. i don't um Sometimes you could say I live there seasonally. I do go on very extensive camping trips. Um, it's very easy to camp in the state because there are lots of national forests, uh, lots of uh, beautiful camping spots in the mountains. So I'll go up to two weeks sometimes. And uh, in terms of the photos, one thing that's really nice about Southeast Arizona, photography is relatively easy there. Uh, a lot of the birds are uh, fairly common. Um, pretty approachable, especially during the time that we go. Uh, everything is singing and active and on territory. Uh, you know, the hummingbirds are present by the hundreds in some cases in some of the feeder setups. So that helps. And I would say most of the photos you saw were actually just taken uh, within this year, actually. Yeah, between, between some visits on my own and between, uh, you know, the handful of tours I've done. Yeah, I, uh, probably I would say 90% of them were taking uh, this year only. Incredible. Yeah, incredible. I think, I think it just shows also the equipment keeps getting better and better and your photographs, yes. keep, yeah, you keep improving and improving and it's all, yeah. It's, it's, but that's, that's fascinating. So like 90% just, just this year on the trips. That's amazing. Yeah, so the, the, the photography there is it's really a fun place for photographers to come. Uh, a lot of the feeder setups, uh, not only do they have hummingbird feeders present, but at the same time, they'll oftentimes have seed feeders, uh, water features, um, uh, suet feeders, jelly, fe uh, jelly feeders, so it attracts woodpeckers, orioles, finches, so it's really, really diverse, so you just sit there and, you know, you might be like this, this is a Lucifer hummingbird female here in Ash Canyon, you're sitting there waiting for the hummingbird to show up, but in the meantime, you're photographing thrashers and finches and woodpeckers, so it's uh, really enjoyable. It's uh, very special indeed. Very, very special. Um, chance of seeing olive warbler. Um, 
some people saying here it's it's an important one given it's in its own family exactly um i would say if you uh, want to see olive warbler do the may tour yeah the mm -hmm. spring spring is better um they are on territory um in august they can be troublesome okay yeah, so the chances are uh, excellent in in may excellent good tip nice um and then finally um aztec thrush what about aztec thrush elise and dave are asking <laughs> that is uh, my personal most wanted actually uh, in, at this point uh, i have okay. now seen the, i have now seen the eared quetzal that was the most wanted for a while but i know aztec thrush is uh it's a very tricky unpredictable it is a um most likely it's a post-breeding disperser so once they are finished nesting in uh, western mexico um, it's essentially endemic to western mexico they'll occasionally move north and reach arizona and that most often happens in late summer to early fall um and there this year there were none reported for example for the whole year so completely uh, unpredictable maybe even a bit eruptive uh, some folks even had lucky and had small flocks of them showing up on some fruiting trees but um mm. i would like to see that bird uh the other problem is they're oftentimes a one-day wonder so they'll they seem to pop up in one of the remote canyons feeding on uh, madrone you know there might be some particular bush and fruit and then people go back the next couple of days and then don't find it again so if you really would like to see an Aztec thrush, I would honestly have to recommend Mexico. Because, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's unpredictable yeah. in the U.S. But on the other hand, um, while I, we're on tour, of course, anywhere in Arizona during any time of year, we always keep a close eye on eBird reports, rare bird alerts, and so on. And the itineraries are flexible enough. There's enough time to be able to, to chase down or look for any of these rarities if they do show up. Excellent, Stefan. Yeah, that's that sounds wonderful. Um, I guess it's one of those. You know, you kind of you kind of want to, or you kind of need those birds that, that keep it interesting. You know, that you oh, want yeah, to they're, highly they're, desirable in this. And there are plenty. Style. I mean, there are plenty in Arizona. I mean, Arizona always gets uh, gets vagrants and rarities. I mean, every every year there's uh, something around. You know, this summer it was mainly um, the cards and uh, hummingbirds. And um, so it's, it varies from year to year. Mm. And that's the beauty about it, right? I mean, there's yes. yeah, it's a little bit unpredictable. You don't know what's oh, going yeah. to catch up, but you kind of know that there's going to be something special, some vagrant, some some real cracking bird to add to your uh, to your to your list. Uh, wonderful. So that that brings us to an end. I'm just going to going to close close off here. Um, and but by just saying uh, rebecca wanted to just just send a message through here so please give my greetings to stefan and to and to claudia uh, for a great talk it was uh, on a tour to alaska um in june and early july this past summer so she's just thank you thank you. you we appreciate it uh, yeah there's a bunch of other great comments that have come through as well and then nikhil forward those to you later um, Stefan, thank you very much. Once again, your talks are always fabulous. Uh, so much background information, so many great photographs. We really appreciate you having or you joining us and, and having you speak to everybody uh, on, on, on these webinars. So thanks yeah, again for your time. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure once again. And we shall see you in two weeks when, uh, as Nikki mentioned earlier, when Lev's going to be chatting a bit about Costa Rica. That's going to be a an absolute crack. I know, Stefan, you've spent quite a bit of time down in Costa Rica yourself, right? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'll, I'll tune in. Yeah, big time. I uh, I was fortunate enough to be there actually in September as well and just mind-blowing, mind-blowing country. Um, it so is. really it looking is. forward to that one. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Enjoy and thanks so much for uh, joining us once again. Cheers Thank all. you, everyone, for taking the time. We'll see you. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.